Welcome back to the podcast. We are here with Michael Peterson, the author of the book, Dominate Your Market, No BS Impact Strategies to Explode Your Business Revenues, Have More Energy, and Get the Life You Really Want. Now, Michael uh, co co contacts growth-minded business owners, and these CEOs hire Michael to grow their revenues along with motivating them to become the best version of themselves, both personally and professionally. So we're going to be talking about how to create rabid fans for your business, how to get your life in order, and use it to create the business and the wealth beyond your wildest dreams. So, Michael, glad to see you again. Glad to talk to you. Robert, thank you for having me on. We are kindred souls. As I don't know if we can say this on the podcast, but you are my audio audible guy. So, yes. Let's go. Yeah, we, we can say I narrated your audio book, right? That's some, sure some and, product integration. I don't know. And, and a gentleman that was just on the call with, a client of mine, just bought the Audible on the call. Nice. On the call. There you go. Nice. So after he listens, now we have to send him to this podcast. That way we get the whole Michael Robert experience. Oh, yeah. And, and so if someone knows me, but they don't know you, what's the elevator pitch? How, what, what can we say? To get someone to sit up and really pay close attention and say, man, this guy, Michael, I've been waiting my whole life for him. What do we say? Well, you know, it's growth, my growth minded CEOs and business owners hire me to to fix their the gaps in their in their marketing and their business development. Um, a lot of them, you know, a lot of the companies out there right now are struggling and they, they might have marketing teams in place. They might have sales guys in place, but they're struggling. They feel stuck. And so. The CEOs bring me on to not only work with them, but to work with their teams, right? And so when I get in there, um, if I find out that there's no sales system in place, there's no business development in place, there's no strategy in place, that's where we start. And a lot of the times, these companies are $10 million, $15 million, $20 million companies that have nothing in place, nothing. And every time I go into one of these businesses on the outside, you say $20 million business, pretty good. And then when I get inside closed doors, it's like, whoa, holy smokes, we got we got a mess on our hands here. And you hear about that sometimes, right? You hear about like the these huge exaggerated cases like Uber or Netflix, and you hear how they lose all this money or they like are headed towards failure. And you're thinking, but they have like one of the best ideas on the planet. They have all these employees, they have all these resources. It's just a matter of maybe like it's managed or configured incorrectly or not even not written down, like you're saying. Yeah, well, well, all it takes is one wrong move in business right, where you, you decide to go a different direction. And, you, and, and as an owner or a CEO, you might think it's little, but that little thing can compound on itself and be a big thing. And within a couple of months, if you don't stay on top of it, your revenues start looking like this. They start going way down and you go, what the hell happened? Well, remember, sir, three months ago when you decided you thought it was a good idea to go this way? Well, you, you didn't change the path. You stayed on that path and it was going down from the get go. And how do you know if you're on the wrong path? Because you always hear about how we need to be bold and take risks and throw out the old and go with the new. So how do you know if you're innovating versus if you're just doing the wrong things? God, that, what a great question. It's all, it's on, it's staying on top of it. So hopefully in your, within your company, you've got a structure, employee structure, where you've got, you know, C-suite, you've got management, you've got VPs, depending on the size of the company. Well, everybody should be held accountable for their specific roles in the company. And one of the first things I ask a new client is, does everybody have a defined role? And most of the time they'll say, well, yeah, perfect. And I'll say, show it to me. And they go, what do you mean? And I say, show me the documentation. Show me their job responsibilities on paper. And they go, well, it's somewhere around here. I let, let, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden it's crickets because they don't have it documented. So if people aren't held accountable to their specific job role, they, you can't blame them, right? I mean, you can blame them partly, but, but there has to be somebody above everybody in the pecking order that holds the person accountable, holds the team accountable. And I'm working, I'm dealing with that with a couple of clients right now that have pretty good sized companies, but nobody's being held accountable for anything. And how does that fit in with, the uh, there, there's always been that 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 trend that everyone wants to be like Google and just have everyone be on like equal footing and no job titles. And that never really made sense to me. And do you hate that as much as I do? Or is there some way that works? There's no structure. Well, if you're Google and you're a trillion dollar company or whatever, I mean, maybe that works where you've got some massive open space warehouse that everybody works on and they can go chat with each other and shoot Nerf baskets and all their stuff. 
But I think in companies that are, you know, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, you know, you're talking about 50 employees, 80 employees, maybe 100, and it, probably a family owned business, generational. That doesn't work, you know, because there's no structure. People are running around doing different roles and different things. And then when it comes down to the accountability part, nobody is held accountable for anything specific. And that becomes an issue when, when if somebody shows up in their job and they have this vague job role, but they, they show up and they, they do their stuff, but it's not really leading towards an outcome, a goal, right? Then you've got, there's no structure involved and you've got a company that's probably not going to make it. And you know, you lately you hear about the the quiet quitting phenomenon, right? Where oh you, yeah, oh, oh boy, here here we go, buckle up, right? Where you, so you get this this employee and they have this uh, kind of nebulous job role, but then over time things kind of drift and there's all these add-ons and suddenly uh, their their job is just this crazy just mix of all these things. And of course, the quiet quitting trend happens when someone says, "I have I have five little pieces of all these jobs. Of course, I'm only going to do." what's assigned to me because it's just, it's such a mess. And so uh, it seems like these companies, they need you to make sure things are written down because once it's written down, it's it's concrete. And then it also seems to be some aspect of the revisiting, right? Like and like going back and looking at that original job role or going back in and fixing up and enhancing, beefing up those SOPs. But I don't know about you, Michael, but sometimes I have to really trick my brain into going back and looking at that website for the 200th time or looking at that document for the 5,000th time. So is there a, a secret to that? Because it, it seems like, you know, when you go to the gym and you're lifting the same weight for like the 1 million at a time, you go back and you have to just like re-examine parts of your business. And sometimes my brain just doesn't want to. Well, well, I think what happens is if you don't have leadership in place in your company at all the different levels, and it could be one or two levels if it's a small company, but if you don't have leadership, then the people don't have direction. If you don't have direction, then you've got people that aren't being held accountable to specific things. And so if you've got a system that's documented, here is my role, here it is. And it shouldn't go out of that box too much, right? And I think you just said something very important. A lot of times that role that, that, that should be compartmentalized should be right here. It starts fraying around the edges. And all of a sudden that person is realizing, wait a minute, I'm doing Joe's job and Sally's job and Susie's job. Wait, and what are they doing? And then all of a sudden you've got this internal conflict in your own mind going, I'm not feeling so good about this job anymore. And then you've got the great resignation, right? You've got people quitting all over the place and they're not quitting for any, well, the, the, you know, the main reasons are they don't feel valued. They don't feel like that their contribution um, is even looked at or considered. And then of course, remote, hybrid, you know, people that have been forced to show up to a building and they're like, why, why am I having to go to this building? I shouldn't have to go here. I can do my job at home. So I think you've got to, you know, the power, and I wrote this in my book, the power has switched from the employer to the employee, right? It's been a massive shift to where now employers can't quote, find good work. They can't find anybody that wants a job. They can't find anybody that's good at their job. This isn't in every sector, by the way, but it's very common to hear that, that you'll hear a CEO go, I just can't, I can't find a good person that wants to do this job, right? So I think when that happens, you've got a broken company and a broken system. And if you don't fix that, you're not going to be around because, you know, billion dollar companies disappear, right? So a lot of times, you know, I'll be um, even having a consultation with not a client, but somebody who's interested in hiring me as their consultant and their revenue is $20 million. Hey, sir, that sounds like a great business. Have you, what you, what, what's the trajectory in the last five years? Oh, it's down. Well, well, that's not a good trajectory. So that means if it keeps going the way you're going, you probably won't be around and let's project out five years. Yeah, probably won't be. Well, how does that feel, right? How does that feel to think that you're gonna be gone in five years? So these are things that the CEOs, I talked about, talk with them about all the time with their mindset. Do they have an open mind to change? If they don't have an open mind to change, that pretty much is the end of the conversation for me right there. It, it really is not a good fit for me. Right. If you're, uh, if you're self-sabotaging, if you're being a downer, if you don't know where your goal is, you won't ever hit it. Well, and I think, I, I think a lot of people, um, they, they shouldn't be in the position they're in. Let's put it that way, to be real, real blunt. 
you know, a, you know, somebody buys a company, let's say, and they say, I'm going to run this thing. Well, maybe they're not doing a good job running it. So they probably shouldn't be running it. They could be the owner, but go get somebody to run it. Right. So you have to know what you, where your strengths lie and then hire outside of that to fill the gaps. And I think a lot of CEOs of $10 million companies, $15 million companies, they think that they can run this thing and they're doing a very poor job doing it. So I, I feel like we're almost like creating, forming like a rubric about what, what leadership is and, and what it means. And people sometimes pay lip service to this idea of self-awareness. But this is interesting because self-awareness, like you said, might mean the, the job I'm in, the task I'm doing is not what I should be doing. And that seems maybe like kind of painful and like a, a blow to the ego. And so when you come to some of the, these owners and you say, you know, maybe you should be the owner, but you shouldn't be running things. Like what, what do they say? Or is there, is there like a way to um, get someone like temporarily to take over to see how it goes? Or like, what's kind of the solution there if the person running this huge company is the wrong person to be doing it? Well, now you're talking about ego, right? And when ego comes into play, it, it's never a pretty situation, right? You know, the phrase, leave, leave your ego at the door, right? Leave it at the door. Because you really need to think of what's the best interest of my company? How can I serve my company the best? If, if, if your company is growing and is successful, then whoever's the CEO, whether it's the owner who bought the company, then kudos to you, keep going. But if it's not, at least be open to the idea of bringing somebody in, even alongside you. You know, you know, because you know, honestly, nobody wants to be told their their baby's ugly. Nobody wants to be told that you're doing a shitty job, sir. Right? Nobody wants to hear that. So, um, you know, I have a tendency to. I mean, you did my book. You kind of know I'm pretty blunt. Um, I'm pretty pretty in your face with with my book. But, um, and that's the people that I work best with, best with is the, the you know, I really work with alpha males. That's, that's really my market. I work with mostly men um, because that's who I vibe with the best, right? So, and a lot of them are ex-athletes like myself. A lot of them are, they're driven, they're ambitious. They, you know, they're biking 30 miles on a Saturday. They're hiking mountains and things like that. That's who I really mix with very, very well because that's my life. That's my lifestyle, right? So if I can work with people like that, I know that they're open-minded because of their own lifestyle. So if I quickly find out from them, hey, what do you do for you? That's one of my first questions. I don't talk about the business. I talk about them. What do you do for you? And a lot of them say, what do you mean? I, I don't know what, what do you mean? I said, no, let me say it again. What do you do for you? Like you mean personally? Yes. What do you do on a daily basis? Do you... What do you do to, re to release your stress? What do you do? What makes you happy? What, what gives you joy? You know, and, and let's say, and I want them to answer it outside of their business. Don't tell me your business for a minute. Let's just talk about you for a minute. And a lot of times they, they haven't talked about themselves for decades. They've never been asked that question. You know, what do you want? What, why are you doing it? Why do you have this company? What's the end goal of your company? And that's, again, one of the first questions I ask, and I talk about that in my book, know your why. Know your personal why and know your business why. This is some deep conversation. And, and so the, this is kind of uh, getting back to this recurring theme of drifting and letting the day-to-day the -day take over and losing sight of that original goal that you might have had 10 years ago or the goal that you should have now for five years from now. And even this a whole uh, line of questioning about like, you know, what do you do for you? What do you do for fun? It reminds me of like some of those job interviews where you sometimes go into a job interview and it wouldn't even be about the job at all. They'd ask about like your, your hobbies and your extracurricular just to like get a feel of who you are as a person. And so it's interesting to think about because like so many either like entrepreneurs or people that have kind of like ascended an organization, it's been so long since they've even, even had a, a job interview or like reassessed if they're on the right track or if they're doing the right thing. And so a lot of what we've been talking about, it's it's really important and it's foundational and it's like really common sense, but also blunt, but also it's such common sense that so few people are applying it. But is there something that has like surprised you or is kind of like, like outside of the box or like on, on the fringe or like a big idea, anything that is just kind of like something wild and crazy that's been happening in your adventures lately? 
my business adventures or my my what adventures which one well i mean is with you is there a difference right personal business like it's all kind of mixed so i mean just yeah just in general in your in your life but personal or business like what has really kind of in the last six months either like like energized you excited you surprised you that's such a great question and it goes to this this yellow book that i just launched that you did the audio on for it this this book I dumped 25 years of my life into this book, right? Like all my experiences from my personal experiences, my athletic experiences, my business experiences, development, personal development. I dumped it all in one book, right? So, um, and I'm very, very proud of the book. I think it turned out very, very well. And what it did for me was it gave me a new definition of what I offer the marketplace, right? It was cathartic for me. I really realized I'm kind of this sort of, personal development, business development guy. I'm kind of, I'm not just one or the other. I want to work with CEOs, growth driven CEOs and business owners that want more out of their life and more out of their business. And the components of getting that is in my book, right? It's the physical component, the mental, mental component, psychological, it's strategies for growth. It's everything I put in the book. So I think in the last six months, the book went live Two months ago, two and a half months ago. I think no, it went live July fourth, the fourth of July. It hit Amazon. How crazy is that? Independence. So talk about a celebration, right? Yeah. So, so how long ago was that? Three months, whatever. But when it went live, I I sort of had to take a step back and go, whoo! Like I wrote this thing in forty-seven days, so I wrote it extremely fast, right? I just dumped it out. Um. So once that rush was over with and it was live on Amazon. I took like a weekend and I did my 40 mile bike ride and my three and, a half, three and a half hour hike and did all my crazy stuff. And during that, those times of reflection, I really realized, wow, it kind of recalibrated what I offer the marketplace. And that's why I feel like this book should get into every CEO's hands, right? I, I feel like, my God, I wish I could go hand it to all of them, free. Take it, take it, take it, take it. Because I think if they read it, they would understand themselves better personally they might understand, it might get them to dig a little deeper on what's their freaking why? What's your why? Why are you doing all this? Why are you doing it for a personal reason? And why are you doing it for a business reason? And then we, we can work from there. So that's been sort of that aha moment for me was the book really encapsulated what I have to offer the marketplace. And and everyone should write a book, right? Even even a yes. short, simple one, just so that way you get that that same kind of clarity we mentioned at the top of the of the conversation about how even just like writing down your own job title or, or writing down these SOPs or, or writing in this book and just figuring out like, what the heck does it all mean? How does it all connect? What And also, what are your strengths? So that way you can be playing to your strengths, not trying to fit that square peg into the, the round hole. And so if that wealth-driven CEO out there who really needs to uh, check out your book and contact your company is listening or watching this podcast, what's the next step? How do they get the book in the first place? And how do they find you and start that conversation? Oh, I appreciate that. Well, I created an author website where they can get the first chapter for free. So that's at www.dominateyourmarketbook.com. So it's the title of the, my book and then the word book on the end of it. So www.dominateyourmarketbook.com. Go there, you can get the first chapter for free. Um, that first chapter, as you know, you did the audible as a ball buster. It's pretty, I just come out of the gate pretty aggressive right away. Um, what, what's it, what's it, do you remember the, the chapter title of chapter one? It all ran together. Sorry. Don't bullshit yourself. Nice. Right out of the gate, right? So they can go there to get that. Um, I'm very, very active on LinkedIn. So they can definitely go to my LinkedIn and type in Michael Peterson. And I think there's a bunch of me in there, but. If you typed in Michael Peterson business, probably something like that in the search bar, you could find me. I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm in LinkedIn probably an hour or two hours every single day. So that, that's, that's a platform that I love to connect with people on. And this is a, a great time to be alive and a great time to be in business because now because of platforms like LinkedIn and podcasting, you can choose your mentor. And you always hear all these platitudes about how you are the person that you surround yourself with. And, you know, now if you want to find some, some low energy person or some uh, kind of a consistent person, if that's a match for you, that's great. But if you want this, this balls to the wall to use 
I'm sure that's that's the phrase you've used, right? This oh, yeah. in in your face, blunt, uh, runs five hours type of person. Then you need to uh, get Michael Peterson in in your inner circle and go to dominateyourmarketbook.com. And then after they read the book, uh, if they if they want to get on on a call or start that conversation, is LinkedIn the best way to do it, or do they go to the website? Or what's the step after the book? At the very end of the book, there's a call to action. And there's there's a link at the back of the book. I think it might be mikepeterson.com slash let's talk, something like that. It's at the it's at the end of the book. But really at that point, now people know what the kind of individual I am and how passionate I am. Either I'm for you or I'm not for you, right? And, and that's fine either way. But uh, but definitely um, I feel like, and one last thing I want to say before we go, people make decisions and take action based on pain, not pleasure. And do not give this away, but the last story in my book, when I heard it on a podcast and I put it in my book, it was so profound to me. Do not get, don't be a spoiler alert here, but people have to go get the book just to read that story at the very end, because I've gotten three clients that read my book and that last story, they hired me as their consultant from that last story in the book, literally three of them. They're nice. like, that story, because the story read, it talks about pain. How bad is your pain, sir? Or you know what I mean? If your pain is bad enough, you'll do whatever it takes. If your pain isn't bad enough, you'll stay in limbo forever. Interesting. So that's a great place for us to leave off is, is tap into the pain, use the pain. The pain will push you away from the mediocrity and get you to where you want to go. And we want you as the podcast listener to go through the gauntlet, right? Because Michael is showing some leadership and saying, I'm not just going to give away that last chapter or that last little bit or whatever. Get the book first and go through it. So that way you can make sure that you're the right fit and get to the end and get to that last story. And then if you say, you know, this, this guy, Michael, he's just okay. Well, then maybe he's not for you. But if you say, man, this is a magic made in heaven this is the right fit this story really connected with me then at the end of that book uh take the next step and contact michael so dominateyourbook.com we fit a ton into this podcast is there any final final thoughts or should we just leave it where we left it let's leave it where we left it but the url you just gave me you gave them was incorrect dominateyourmarketbook.com okay dominateyourmarketbook.com dominateyourmarketbook.com and that is that's true branding because you go and you catch the mistakes and you do the repetitions and you get those SOPs in order. Dominate your marketbook.com. We will see you there. And thank you, Michael, for stopping by and having a lot of fun here. Robert, thank you so much. I appreciate it.